into the sky Never let adventures pass you by Be free and follow your crazy dreams We're living our vision in the RV Come ride with us and you'll be free We just came over to Mercedes in Tampa and got the new tail light. I just want to show you guys how easy these are to change. I used to change quite a few of these back in the day when I used to do some rebuilding of cars, um, kind of a side hobby thing. These tail lights used to be on most cars where you had to get back in the back panel, take the panel off inside and, and get to everything a lot different. So I'm gonna lay this here. I hate to drop that thing. So right here in this panel, if you can show, if you open up the door, there is a screw it's hard to see but a little a little ellen screw there and one there so i went ahead and taken it out i just used a little ellen wrench because of the space i've got to get my hand in there but after you take those two ellen screws out there's two little pointy see these little pointy things here they just go in that hole so you either pop them out or they slide out so you can take it and try to slide it this way or just pop them out. This one stayed in and the new one has uh, new. Unlike all the older ones that I'm used to, each bulb had its own little plug. This just has one plug for all lights. And what makes this so expensive is it has a bunch of LED lights in there also, besides having the Mercedes name. <laughs> All right, so now we got the new light. Like that. Plug this back up in until it clicks. And then this and this goes in those two little holes there. Make sure your wiring harness doesn't get caught here. You don't crimp it when you're trying to put this in. And you got a little hole there, a little hole there. Pop it in until it pops. That means it's snug. Now it shouldn't fall out. Now come back in, we just have those two screws to put in and we're good. To get this first one in, you might have to pull the light in and look to see if the hole lines up and then put that screw in there just to get that lined up. Now the bottom one should be lined up now. There's a little bit of play with these screws. When you're putting them on, you can move this light ever so slightly. So close the door real easy once you got this closed to make sure the door's not gonna hit it any because you might have to loosen the screw up just to push it out just a little bit and then tighten it to make sure. I'm gonna see if my gap's the same as the other side. Okay, so as you can see, the gap comes closer here. It gets just a little bit wider up here. That means I've got this end in just a little bit. You can see how this matches up with this line right here. I need to push this out so that so that gap's the same. Come over here and look at this one. See how that gap is bigger all the way down. That's it. Good as new. And don't forget to check the tail light. Make sure all the lights work. Hold on to the hand of self-destruction. I'm back to a place that I left a long time ago. Here we are, last day of our uh, meet and greets. You thought I was doing a live, didn't you? <laughs> no, I'm just out of breath. I wouldn't do that to you. We're walking so fast, but it's Me been too. enjoyable to finally meet a lot of people. Yes, very much so. We would like to take a brief moment to thank everyone who came out to meet us at our meet and greets on Thursday and Saturday at the Florida RV Super Show in Tampa, Florida. Kevin's meals at Costco before and I think they have them at Walmart too but they're a smaller package the Costco ones have like a double package and we usually 
used both packages of the chicken and the sauce. The one package really isn't enough for two people, but, um, but anyway, they're like a healthier option for meals, and uh, we both like it. They come in all different flavors, and they're pretty quick to make. We're downtown Tampa, and we're coming to a restaurant that one of our viewers had told us about. Uh, it's called the Columbia. Plenty of parking, as you can see, we got in with the van. And the place is right over here. After you, my dear. Oh, are we uh, underdressed for this place? This place is gorgeous. What do you think of this place? Very, very cool. Now it's called the Don Quixote. This was actually the first air conditioned room in Florida, so we used to pay a dollar to come and sit here. For gluten free, they give you a dish of plantain chips. Freshly made Cuban bread. The Don Quixote Room at the Columbia was Tampa's first dining room and helped the restaurant gain prominence for fine dining. It was also Tampa's first air-conditioned dining room. The chairs were made in pre-World War II Czechoslovakia. In 2005, they were placed in storage and renovated for use at the Columbia Cafe at Tampa Bay History Center. This is what I got. Looks amazing. I can't remember the name of it, but might be able to point it out on the menu. <laughs> I got salmon. This is their gluten-free flan. Most flan is gluten-free, I guess. <laughs> and my goodness, that's bread pudding. That look, that's two pieces. So they were correct when they said it's shareable. Big enough to share. White chocolate. As an ambitious young Spanish-Cuban immigrant, Casimiro Hernandez Jr. left Cuba with his family, searching for opportunity and a better life in 1902. Lured by the opportunities in Ybor City, Tampa's cigar-producing Latin Quarter, he was a prosperous future in the land of plenty. No stranger to hard work, he found his future in the Florida Brewery on Fifth Avenue. Casamero worked at the brewery long enough to glimpse a new opportunity at a place named the Columbia. The restaurant began as a small corner cafe, which was originally a humble saloon known for its Cuban coffee and authentic Cuban sandwiches. The Columbia Cafe catered to Ybor City's hard-working immigrants and local cigar workers with light meals and strong drinks. With Florida's prohibition of alcohol in 1918, the Columbia hastily transformed into a restaurant and expanded the facility. In 1919, Casimiro took over the next door restaurant, La Fonda and converted it into an additional dining room. His son, Casimiro Jr., was invited by his father to take the helm and so joined the business. This place is amazing. It's got, what'd she say, 15 dining rooms? I don't know, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's what she said, but the, the prices really aren't too bad either for what you get. This is uh, mm -hmm. really, really cool. Oh, look at that statue down there in the middle. La Fonda was owned by the Garcia brothers, who went on to own a share of the Columbia restaurant until the 1930s, when Manuel Garcia sold his share to Hernandez and went on to buy another restaurant in 1938. Casimiro may have become a full-time restaurateur, but that is not to say he abandoned the sale of strong drink altogether. It was by no means uncommon, especially in Ybor City, when citizens had a healthy disdain for prohibition laws. Balita, an illegal lottery brought from Cuba, became Tampa's favorite pastime. The Colombia's bartenders were never without work. Tampa became known for Ybor City's delicable food and fine cigars. Colombia classics such as Spanish bean soup, Cuban sandwiches, and chicken and yellow rice became the highlights of many a visit. In 1919, Casimiro's son sought to transform the Colombia into an elegant dining room with music and dancing. Casimiro Jr. was truly a visionary because in 1919, there were no such restaurants in all of the southeastern United States. Today, the five-generation family owned Landmark in Florida's oldest restaurant and the largest Spanish restaurant in the world. 
The original location boasts 15 dining rooms and 1,700 seats. Over nearly 120 years, the original restaurant was expanded to an entire city block. There now are five Columbia restaurants and two Columbia cafes at the Tampa Bay History Center and at Tampa International Airport. I am so glad we went there. That is a must-see and eat. <laughs> must-see and must-eat. The food, definitely, if we're going to use um, our same nice. old ratings, I guess it was it's a nine for their food that we had. The bread pudding, she said, was the best she ever had. Ever, ever. Mm -hmm. um, that is easily a nine and a half dessert, probably. Oh. Uh, as far <laughs> as bread pudding goes, it's the best. Yeah, and the flan was the best just I ever good, had. Yeah. We're thinking that we're just going to start rating the places that are extraordinary. <laughs> Like Sherman's Deli's uh, coconut cream pie. <laughs> <laughs> and the Columbia. <laughs> yes. It's now on the list. It definitely is on there. This is, uh, the, besides the food, it's just an amazing place to experience for dining. And the, oh, the right. service is excellent. The prices, for a place like this, the prices are very good. Mm -hmm. And just the, the building, the architecture, um, the beauty of it all is remarkable yeah and don't worry about um, being dressed up there's people that come here that are not dressed up too so well, casual at least for the lunch hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess we haven't came at supper yet mm. but looks like they have parking right here across the street on the other side as well so the restaurants over there and then over here in this building is their museum it's closed today, but it goes clear over to the other side too, but you can't see very good over there with the glare. the Columbia told us uh, if you go in their gift shop this is the place that roasts the coffee that they sell but they've moved out of this building and moved down the road obviously as you can see the windows are gone <laughs> it's spelled y-b-o-r but it's pronounced ebor ebor city is a historic neighborhood just northeast of downtown tampa florida ebor city was founded as an independent town in 1885 by a group of cigar manufacturers led by vicente martinez ebor and was annexed by tampa in 1887. the original population was mostly composed of cuban and spanish immigrants who worked in the cigar factories italian and eastern european jewish immigrants followed shortly thereafter and established many retail shops farms and grocery stores, box factories, print shops, and other enterprises which catered to the cigar industry and its workers. Martinez Ibor started the practice of building small houses, casitas, that his workers could buy at cost in order to increase staff retention. He also helped to ensure medical care and paved the local streets and sidewalks. The neighborhood grew rapidly during the 1890s, quickly evolving from a primitive outpost with streets of loose sand populated mainly by young Cuban and Spanish men seeking work into a bustling city with modern amenities and a diverse demographic makeup. During this decade, Ybor City's residents founded mutual aid societies, labor organizations, newspapers in several languages, and many other social and civil organizations along with a diverse roster of businesses helping to create a vibrant civil society that blended the residents' different cultures of origin into a new Latin culture unique to Tampa. Ebor City continued to grow and prosper through the 1920s, by which time its factories were producing almost a half a billion hand-rolled cigars every year, giving Tampa the nickname the Cigar City. The coming of the Great Depression in the early 1930s brought a sharp reduction in the worldwide demand for fine cigars, and Ebor City's economic base suffered greatly. Some cigar factories closed, others ended the hand-rolled tradition and turned to mechanization to reduce costs, and remaining operations sharply decreased production and payrolls, resulting in widespread unemployment and hardship across the entire neighborhood. Demand for cigars increased after World War II, but by that time, 
almost all of Ybor City cigar factories were mechanized and did not rehire the skilled and well-paid they had once employed by the thousands. As veterans returned from the war, they largely chose to leave the aging neighborhood for areas with better housing and economic prospects, accelerating the trend of declining population and economic contraction. This process accelerated further through the 1950s and 60s, when the Federal Urban Renewal Program and the construction of Interstate 4 resulted in the demolition of many structures, including hundreds of housing units. Planned redevelopment never took place and, with its commercial district and social core virtually abandoned, Ybor City lapsed into a period of neglect and decay. Since the year 2000, many historic structures near 7th Avenue have been renovated and restored and construction has filled in most long vacant lots. Among the new structures are hotels, office and retail space, and apartment complexes, leading to Ybor City's first population increases in over half a century. Residential areas such as VM Ybor and Tampa Heights have also begun to see older structures being restored and new ones built. Any idea why that chicken crossed the road? Run! Run for your lives! Run! Excuse me. Can you tell me why you crossed the road? You understand that? He said, ah! Something like This is the last day of the Tampa RV show. Just uh, checking our tanks here. Got to go out and empty our tanks. We are um, in the media section of the Tam Tampa RV show at the fairgrounds in Tampa. So we have actually have full hookups. Michelle's in the bathroom. She's getting uh, taking a shower. Believe it or not. Yeah, I know, it's about time, isn't it? This year we did the Tampa show just a little bit different. We only went in to the show on two days and it was our meet and greet days. Had other things going on. We went down and um, filmed a little bit of Ybor City, as you saw. Two nights, uh, Gretsch RV put us up in a hotel at Hard Rock Hotel. Just a little appreciation uh, to us and uh, a little break. It was, it was really nice and uh, we appreciate that. We get the question a lot of times, uh, do you guys stay in hotels sometimes? Come on, be honest. <laughs> well, the only times that we have, honestly, is when Gretsch has put us up like that and like it's been here and then when we go out to California and we're bringing the RV back, uh, when we went to pick up the RV the first time, uh, those are the only times. Other than one time, that uh, when we were back in Iowa, we uh, had our granddaughter stay with us and we just rented a hotel for one night on the weekend and uh, enjoyed the pool and everything with her. And we did that two times, but it was one night each when we were back in Iowa, but that's it. But, you know, keep in mind with something like this, you can easily do that if you want to. Uh, you don't have to worry about parking like you do when you're pulling something, you know, or a big class A or big class C, whatever. Um, so that is an option if you want to, we just never do. But not a bad idea. That's it, we're gonna head down to Fort Lauderdale and see what kind of goodies we can find you for next week.
Okay, I'm just gonna say it. This place looks a little sketchy coming in. This is extremely sketchy. This is the first time we've been to this park in Fort Lauderdale. We haven't been to any RV resorts here in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, there's a bunch of people working on vehicles right by the gate. And the guy on his cart says, when you get to the gate, just punch get in the gate. <laughs> We're thinking, oh, let's just announce the code to everybody. Great. <laughs> You might Very need to secure. edit that because it depends on how often they change the code. Oh no, it's okay. Everybody knows. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, click that little bell, and hit that thumbs up. See you next week.